morning, glory and evening, grace, America. A good Tuesday to you on this, the 23rd of September. A very special day because a very special book appears in bookstores today. A Path Appears, Transforming Lives, Creating Opportunity by Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wudun. Wudun. I begin by saying that uh, very rarely do I give three hours over to her book. Uh, usually it's been on the war. Lawrence Wright on the Looming Tower or Rajiv Chandrasekharan on Little America, Jake Tapper on The Outpost. But over the 15 years I've been doing this show, once in a while, I'll do a non-war book for an entire show. You will remember Jay Matthews' Work Hard, Be Nice, or Thomas P.M. Barnett's The Pentagon's New Map, Wayne Grudem and Barry Asmus' The Poverty of Nations. You'll remember Bishop N.T. Wright's How God Became King, or Clayton Christensen's How to Measure a Life, or even Hitch 22 by the, the late, great Christopher Hitchens. Those were all different kinds of books, books I thought might impact and change the course of your life. And now I think... When a Path Appears has that same potential. So we're going to spend all day talking with its author, Nick Kristoff. Now, this is a pretty easy deal because Nick's a big name. He's a bestseller, two-time Pulitzer winner. Cheryl Wudun, Wudun is his wife. She's also a Pulitzer Prize winner. She's a banker. Nick Kristoff, welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Is Cheryl with you this morning at all? Unfortunately, she's not. She's in a plane, but I'm delighted to be with you, and she sends her best to you and the audience. Well, it's better because uh, her name is one of those names that manages to trip me up, like uh, well, so <laughs> many do. So, Nick Kristoff, I can do. Congratulations, first of all, on a path that appears being in bookstores today. It's big launch day, uh, and there's quite a Thank lot you. of momentum. Uh, you've got a documentary coming out as well as a website, A Path Appears? That's right. There'll be a documentary on PBS beginning in January. How, how long is that going to be for? The documentary will be four hours. Oh, see, that's pretty amazing. Now, uh, Twitter, you can follow A Path Appear at A Path Appears. Nick's Twitter account is at Nick Kristoff with one F, and at Wu Dunn is his wife's. Now, the, the blurbs are from Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter, Bill and Melinda Gates, Bono, but also Bill Hybels. I just want to tell my center-right audience, there's a lot more in this book than the blurbs might let you understand at first glance. You're a little bit worried, Nick Kristoff, that the center-right audience might say, ah, New York Times columnist, Pulitzer winner, Bill Gates, Bill Clinton, not going to read it. Yeah, I am. I I mean, I, uh, you know, my natural audience uh, tends to be, you know, more center left. And one of the lessons we've uh, we've learned is you can't begin to address so many of these social issues unless you really have a a broad coalition. And uh, and. You know, I do think these are issues, you know, creating opportunity that left and right do fundamentally agree on. And especially if it becomes more an issue of, you know, looking where the evidence is, what works, what doesn't work, then I think there is some possibility of both sides kind of holding their nose and working together for the common good. I agree with this. And that's why I want everyone, my regular audience, to listen very closely. I think this book will change how you give your money, your time, and your service. And it it will do so because it's sort of rigorously researched on the scientific end. I I pummel my audience, Nick, with appeals for this and for that. And we'll talk about that in the course of the show. And always in the background is the question, is that the best allocation of my time and service? And that's really the question at the heart of a path appears. What's the best use of your time and your service? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really a idea that comes from the business world that, you know, what are the metrics we have to, to measure how effective uh, this is going to be? And I think that um, one of the real advantages of more people from the business world going into the humanitarian world in recent years has been that they have brought a real emphasis on measurement, on evaluation, and on getting the most bang for the buck. And, you know, if it's important to get the most bang for your buck in, uh, when you're a millionaire investor, it's a thousand times more important to get bang for the buck when you're dealing with potentially life-saving interventions. And not merely for the recipients, but also for the giver. I, I've got a buddy in uh, Philadelphia, Archbishop Chaput. He wrote a column last summer about Marcus Aurelius's meditations, which he called a map to living a worthy life. I think what you're trying to do is b- rebuild that map here, is that you don't want people to waste their efforts. That's right. And um, I mean, w- one of the things that really struck us in writing the book is that we always start out trying to empower other people. And look, you know, helping people is harder than it looks. And our record of helping others has a somewhat mixed record of success, although I think we can do better. But it has this almost perfect record of helping ourselves. And that's not just a um, kind of a, a vague hunch. I mean, really, there is now real uh, evidence of that from neuroscience, from careful studies. There was one um, one study that I saw that um, 
that if you join a church, uh, then uh, this is for senior citizens, then uh, mortality rate is cut by 29%. If you exercise regularly, then your mortality is cut by, I forget, 30 some percent. And if you volunteer for one or more organizations, uh, then your uh, mortality risk falls by another 44%. You know, so I guess the key is probably to volunteer for a religious running organization. Then you you just never die. <laughs> that, no, <that's, laughs> that study's on page 242 to 243. I made a note of that. I also point out, you had on page 17, a growing stack of evidence has shown that social behavior, including helping others, improves our mental and physical health and extends life expectancy. And you quote the, the Harvard study, the longevity study, that follows 268 Harvard undergrads from youth, life, and old age. Altruists seem disproportionately likely to age gracefully and maintain their health. Indeed, a willingness to help others seems more important to longevity than cholesterol levels. So that's self-interest, yeah, astonishing. Right? Absolutely. And, you know, here is a case where self-interest coincides with, with helping others. And, I mean, you, you mentioned Bill Hybels, uh, uh, blurb earlier. And I think this is something that, that Bill and the megachurches have really done very successfully is to figure out how to combine, uh, giving back with just a frank acceptance that this is something that isn't a burden, it's not a sacrifice, but it's something joyful. And when done in a social way with others, can make oneself feel good as well as making other people feel good. I think that there's the that the rest that the secular world has a lot to learn from the way um, you know Bill Hybels and others approach giving. Now you have got probably I tried to count there are more than a hundred stories in this book and it's written in a very interesting way. It's sort of a layered approach to t- storytelling and you loop back over some themes repeatedly, which we'll talk about. But I want to start at a, maybe an unusual place with Yak Yorn on page three hundred five. It's sort of towards the end of the book. But it leaps up out. You've been reading about, I've been reading about this initiative, that initiative, this entrepreneur, that successful intervention. And all of a sudden, you you and your wife are in the middle of the fields of Cambodia and you hear someone keening. Uh, yeah, I, I will. I will never forget that. Uh, I was in the jungle in Cambodia. And, um, you know, I, I the backdrop is that. I think that we all subconsciously somehow absorb the idea that because there are so many deaths in the developing world that, you know, that life is cheap, uh, that people somehow get used to it. And I was walking on a jungle path with my interpreter, and we heard this incredible screaming. It, we didn't know if it was an, an animal noise or, or what. It was just unreal. And we approached very, very nervously. And we came to a clearing, and there was this man, Yok Yorn, and he was cradling the body of his uh, son, who, if I remember right, was 10, who had just died of malaria. And he was hugging the boy, cradling the boy, and, um, you know, nobody who could have seen that grief uh, that day could have ever subscribed to the idea that, um, you know, that, that, that life is cheap, that people ever get used to the idea of losing uh, a child. And, you know, what really struck me is that that is, a, that is the kind of thing that, that we can prevent for the price of, a, of, of what we spend on coffee. You know, a bed net, an anti-malaria bed net would have saved that, that, that child's life. And, um, and actually that same day I met another – Another family, uh, maybe two miles away, that had they had four children. I was a grandmother looking after four of her grandchildren uh, because the mother had just died of malaria, and she had one malaria bed net that could fit three of the kids. And every night she had to figure out which of the kids she was going to leave out of the bed net. This is a five dollar bed net, and you know it was the most excruciating decision she could make, and she had to make it every night. And um, <laughs> That is, to me, to witness suffering is to inspire compassion and sometimes action. But it's also, as you say, the poor do not become inured to their suffering, which may be a temptation in the West. We've been covering the Ebola uh, outbreak, Nick, and you know Africa better than anyone. It's a nightmare. And the West tends to say that's over there and that nightmare sounds pretty awful. But but what could be done? You know? Nothing. That's right. Done. And we somehow think, oh, you know, they must be numb to to suffering and. In fact, you know, we're the ones who are, are numb to it. And 
what has struck me over and over is that the people on the front lines, whether it's in Liberia dealing with Ebola or it's Cambodians dealing with uh, with malaria, is that people who have nothing will so often share their nothing with those around them. Very powerful stories in that regard will come to them. I'm spending the day with Nick Kristoff of the New York Times, double Pulitzer Prize winner, his brand new book, authored with Cheryl Wudan. It's out today. That's his wife. A Path Appears, Transforming Lives, Creating Opportunities. Uh, the website is apathappears.org. I'll give you all the information about the documentary and the Twitter feeds when we return. Don't go anywhere. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Maybe I'll be there to shake your hand. Twenty-one minutes after the hour, America. It's Hugh Hewitt, special edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show on September the twenty-third, twenty fourteen. First time it, it broadcasts. It's the publication date for a brand new book, A Path Appears. It's linked at HughHewitt.com. I'd like to urge everybody involved in giving money or administering the giving of money to go and get a copy of A Path Appears. I ordered up for all nine members of the board on which I've served for 15 years, the Prop 10 Commission in Orange County, California, that's given away a half billion dollars. I've asked my elders at my churches to get a copy of it, and I will encourage all of my partners at Errant Fox to get copies of it, uh, because it is a, it's going to profoundly impact those who read it, how they go about giving life in service, because it's a lot of empirical data pulled together in one place. Uh, I had allocated an hour to talk to Nick Kristoff, because he's Nick Kristoff, a New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning opinion writer. He's been on the show many, many times. And then as I read it, I got more and more enthusiastic, largely because it confirmed some of my biases, some of which it did not, but nevertheless, it provoked me along the way. And I want to begin with one of my biases, Nick Kristoff. Generosity, in my opinion, is learned behavior. Now, your children gave you a rat for your birthday. <laughs> they did. Um, this was this was actually for Father's Day, Father's uh, Day as it. I recall. Um, and there is a um, there is a group of people. Uh, it's an organization called Apopo that is training these these special kind of rats that have an incredibly good sense of smell. They're training them to detect landmines and also to uh, detect cases of tuberculosis by sniffing them. And it's incredible to watch these rats at work. They, they, you know, they don't sit off the landmines because they're too light and so they can go across the field sniff sniffing and they stop at one at, at a, at a mine or, uh, in the lab, they set up a bunch of, of trays of, uh, sputum and the rats walk along and they stop at one that has tuberculosis. And, you know, the more reliable than, uh, lab workers and they they can test far, far more a day, and they cost so little to train. So my kids um, got me. They they sponsored a one of these uh, hero rats. They're called uh, in my name, and boy, I was I was flattered to to get a rat, yeah, an African <laughs> giant father. pouched rat, an African giant pouched rat. Now my point of that is, it's a it's a funny story, and it's an interesting story. And I was amazed that they can clear four times the amount of land as a human being, um, and of course, at, without risk to the human being. But your children have learned a behavior. They know what satisfies you and what gives you joy. And I've often said to people who are atheists, take your kids to, to Sunday school anyway, because they'll learn how to give. And it is learned behavior, Nick Kristoff. Do you agree with that? I, I, you know, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, I mean, there's some indications that it's very, very, very young infants, uh, that if they see uh, somebody, an adult who um, they think is who pretends to have hurt himself, then very early on they will try to comfort that individual. They'll share a teddy bear, um, and in our brains, the uh, if people are are scanned when they see somebody else suffering, then the parts of your brain that light up are the same as those that when you yourself are are injured. I mean, our, an injury to somebody else can also uh, affect ourselves. But having said that. Um, it's also true that we're socialized people and we absorb the values of our families, our communities. And there's obviously, you know, a lot of people who manage to be oblivious to the suffering around them and other people who are enormously responsive. And so in that sense, I, I think we start with some kind of hardwiring for empathy, for altruism, 
but it's it's kind of hardwiring, and the software comes from the way we're nurtured, especially by our families. From that so hardware you, side, I was thinking of the serotonin connection, if it's early on released with the the uh, one vast day of sharing is run by a bunch of Protestant churches. If you get that serotonin impulse early, you may want it back. You might learn and actually become addicted to giving, which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You're very, Absolutely. You're, you're non-judgmental about categories of service and charity, provided that they assist the needy or the oppressed. I, I would say that's – is that a fair statement, a summary of it? Yeah, that – look, there are lots of ways to um, to spend money, to volunteer – but to us, the paramount one is to create opportunity uh, to, to give people a chance to get a better life. And so that that mostly returns on investment for the very poor or the very oppressed. You are not a fan, I gather, or Cheryl, of vast endowments and Ivy covered universities as a first choice for philanthropy. Um, yeah, I think that would be fair. I mean, I, I think that they're all kind. I mean, look, I I donate um to uh, all kinds of causes, including arts organizations, including uh, universities. But I think where we get the most bang for the buck is um, is helping the neediest. Well, it's interesting because I, I, I'll press you on this a little bit. Sure. I, I, you're a Harvard grad, right? I am. And so, as am I. And, and so our university has a $32 billion endowment. I haven't given them a dime in years. I can't, I can't bring myself to divert a dime from, for example, save the children to send it to Harvard. I mean, it, it makes no moral sense to me. Does it to you? Yeah. Yeah, Hugh. I mean, I've, I've, it's an interesting question. I've thought about this uh, a lot and I, I just wrote a check the other day, um, uh, to Harvard. So I was thinking about it again. And I guess the way, I guess where I come down, um, is, is, I mean, a few different things going on. One is that, while I think that uh, Harvard and other Ivy institutions uh, aren't as economically diverse as they should be, and uh, but still institutionally and through their research and their programs, then they do create uh, support for uh, for the entire country. And a lot of the research we cite, for example, on uh, on cortisol and very young children. That comes from a uh, Center for the Developing Child at, at Harvard. So I think that there is a certain amount of research there that does support uh, everybody. And indeed, uh, some funding goes to support uh, kids in given scholarships and so on. But but I still, I mean, I take your point that most of the beneficiaries uh, at the major institutions are people who are already pretty well off. And so for that reason, I guess I think of, um, you know, giving a little bit like a buffet and I want to have a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables, but I also uh, want to support, uh, give back to an institution that I went to. I want to support, um, you know, a, a theater that I deeply believe in, even though that's not uh, even though I wouldn't want to argue that that is uh, going to be as – get as much bang for the buck as a life-saving intervention like a bed net. I, I agree. I'm not against giving to universities. I urge people to give, for example, to Hillsdale College and Colorado Christian University all the time. It's the endowment that's, that, that makes it a problem for me, Nick. $32 billion. And, and those institutions which are vastly funded in this world use so little of that endowment. And I'm not sure our tax code – this is an incentive to, in, to inquire with Paul Ryan, encourages them to use as much of their resources as ought to be used at a moment when opportunities to genuinely impact the sciences, in, in other words. Now we know it works. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an open question. Again, one that I'm, I'm a little ambivalent about uh, the, you know, the, the tax write-offs for charitable giving and whether they should be more narrowly targeted so that it's really only for those donations that are clearly creating uh, opportunity. And, you know, a lot, I mean, it is, it is true that a lot of people are writing checks to private schools or to colleges basically so that their kids or their grandkids are going to get in. And I'm not sure that taxpayers should be subsidizing that. I'll be right back with Nick Kristoff, who, along with Cheryl Wudon, have written in a more, uh, very, very important book, A Path Appears. It's linked at HughHewitt.com. The website, apathappears.org, has more information on it. You can follow Nick on Twitter at Nick Kristoff, with one S, with one F, K-R-I-S-T-O-F, or A Path Appears, or at Wudon. I'll be right back. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.
24 minutes after the Hour America. It's Hugh Hewitt spending the day with Nick Kristoff, two-time Pulitzer winner at the New York Times columnist there. His brand new book, co-authored with Cheryl Wadon, his wife, is A Path Appears, Transforming Lives and Creating Opportunity. It's linked at HughHewitt.com. It's in bookstores everywhere. Today is publication date. That's why I'm doing it today amidst all this news, uh, and we'll bring you breaking news as it would occur throughout the, the half hours. But the uh, the fact is, wherever you look in the world, there's suffering. We've got our eyes paying attention to Ebola right now and our eyes paying attention to the rampaging of IS. But next year, it'll be different chapters everywhere. Next decade, it'll be different chapters. How do you actually make a dent in it? And a path appears as an attempt to comprehensively survey what works, both at home in the United States and abroad. Um, I, I want to spend the short segment here, Nick Kristoff, on the matter of the church as agent of charity. Now, you recognize the book is full of nuns and priests and pastors. They appear out of nowhere to do great good on on pages 130 to 140, there's this remarkable story, a Kenyan named Kennedy, and there's a priest, a nun, a pastor, there's also a UN worker and a college, there, there's all these religious folk, though, that make Kennedy out of the Kenyan slums an amazing success, and and they show up throughout the book, on the other hand, you, I think you might be consciously trying to avoid commenting on church's charity as much as possible. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm trying to avoid that we um you know in we have a, a a section in which we talk about the uh the way uh the religious world and the secular world kind of need to cooperate and each needs to acknowledge that the other uh is engaged in humanitarian efforts and does some really good work um but you can't i mean you can't report it on uh, global suffering without acknowledging the incredible work that so many missionaries and others are, are doing in the field. And, you know, in contrast to a lot of aid workers, these are people who often stay for many, many, many years, uh, speak local languages, not just, not just the European language, but the local tribal language. Um, they send their kids to the local schools. And when everybody else is evacuated, you know, they're the, they stay behind very often. So um, I have just enormous respect for some of these folks. Now, my, my Presbyterian congregation just sent 73 people to South Africa and Swaziland. And my friends in the LDS, I got a bunch of friends who are Mormons, they undertake these vast philanthropic efforts. And it's truly incredible since their church takes tithing very, very seriously. Catholic charities are motivated. They're always at work. If you took the religiously motivated service and giving out of anti-poverty and anti-oppression programs, Dick Kristoff, uh, by what percentage do you think those efforts would decline globally? You know, I think it would vary a lot by country. Um, in Africa, the health establishment would be just just crushed. Um, you know, likewise in Haiti, it would be destroyed. I. Um, I've always felt a little um, kind of ambivalent because on the one hand, in writing about AIDS, uh, I was aghast at the way the Vatican was uh, discouraging the use of condoms as a tool to to fight HIV transmission. On the other hand, it was very obvious that there were so many, you know, so many people on the front lines trying to fight HIV and, uh, were these nuns, these priests, uh, these Catholic hospitals. And indeed, while the Vatican's position was very hostile to, uh, to the use of condoms in those circumstances, you know, the nuns and the priests often on the ground were, uh, looking the other way, occasionally even handing them out. So it's a lot more complex on the ground than, you know, at the it's so interesting positions are to prepare for the interview. I took a couple of Domin- uh, Norbertine uh, priests uh, monks out to lunch, and we talked about this. And they said, "Well, a lot of the secular world will never get our infinite perspective. Um, you know, we're playing for infinity and the soul, and so we have to play both with the suffering in front of us and the inf- infinite uh, destination of the soul. And that really does bring the worlds into collision at some point. But for the most part." If, for example, you talk about freeing children from slavery, you'll find the International Justice Mission and you'll find your secular groups. Uh, if you if you talk about secular care, you'll find Upon This Rock Medical Center running a hospital in southern Nigeria. Every category has, seems to me, after Absolutely. reading your book, has a secular and Absolutely. a sectarian parallel. Absolutely. And one of my frustrations is that they don't cooperate more, partly because we are in such a polarized age and everybody is so distrustful. And so you look at sex trafficking and, you know – 
There are some genuine disagreements, but everybody agrees that 15-year-old girls shouldn't be trafficked by pimps, shouldn't be locked up in brothels, uh, you know, whether we're talking about Cambodia or whether we're talking about L.A. And yet, because of this suspicion, there isn't nearly enough cooperation across that that, that, that God gulf to so both sides can put pressure on uh, politicians here and abroad to try to help those uh, those girls and get and end the impunity and get those pimps in jail. More on the sex trafficking trade and other interventions in the life of the oppressed and the very poor. A Path of Peers is linked at HughHewitt.com. Follow Nick Kristoff on Twitter at Nick Kristoff, and you can follow A Path of Peers at A Path of Peers. His wife at Wudun, W-U-D-U-N-N. I'll be right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Four minutes after the hour, America, it's a special edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show on this Tuesday, September 23rd. It's publication day, actually, which is a big day for a book. A Path Appears is a brand new book by New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof. He's the recipient of two Pulitzers. His co-author, Cheryl Wadun, Wadun is his uh, wife and co-author. She's won a Pulitzer. A Path Appears will be a documentary in January on PBS. Uh, the website is apathappears.org. It's a transformative work uh, if you are already in the business of giving some of your money and service. But if you're not, it may move you. And if you're in a position of leadership, it ought to be mandatory reading for those around you about how you operate your organization uh, as they go about trying to help people. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning of the book. I jump around because I, I found the layering of the book so interesting Almost impossible to structure an interview off of this, Nick. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> well, you read it carefully. I'm well, impressed. <laughs> well, it, it just loops. There are loops, and I think you're trying to layer, and uh, and as a result... And amplify the lessons, absolutely. Exactly. And so that's very well done. Uh, we brought in Bridgespan to study this commission I was on after 10 years of giving and maybe $350 million, and they came back, and they said gently, some of the things you're doing are really stupid, and they, they praised what we were doing really well. But then they encouraged us to find the most needy and layer on services. That was the bottom line. And they're very good, as you know, at what they do. They study right. the not-for-profit world. Layer, layer, layer. So I, I believe in it. Let's start with Rachel Beckwith. At the beginning of the book, she wanted to give a birthday party to benefit charity Colon Water, which we'll talk about later. And she was a little bit more than disappointed in how much she raised. And then tragedy struck. Tell the story. Sure. Uh, so Rachel is a little girl in Seattle who from very early on has been has just kind of cared about others. And, you know, uh, her mom, Samantha Paul, um, I think, is a very giving person. And maybe she nurtured this in Rachel. And uh, so then Rachel in her church heard about this group, uh, Charity Water, which digs wells for those people around the world who, who don't have clean water. And Rachel thought, wow, I'm going to donate my ninth birthday uh, and instead of birthday presents, I'm going to ask people to donate to my birthday page on the Charity Water website uh, to help build a well for people. And she set uh, $300 as the goal for what she wanted to, to raise. And then she was checking it every day. And she was just kind of a little um, – she was happy that she got gifts, but she was a little disappointed that um, in the end she uh, – trying to think how much she – she raised. She raised One, 200 and, yeah. or, or, or $230, I think. 200, uh, 220, I think. Okay, yeah. Okay. And, um, and so she was a little disappointed, but at least she'd raised $220, uh, uh, to build a well somewhere. And then shortly after her birthday, um, she was in the car and a couple of trucks had a accident. She was, her vehicle was in the middle of it, of the big pileup. Uh, she was very badly injured. Uh, other people in the car and the family were okay. She was in a hospital and friends and um, family members, people in the church, they were um, trying desperately to show their love and support uh, for Rachel. And they uh, did so by donating on her uh, birthday page for Charity Water, which was still up even though her birthday had passed. And so they donated more and more. Uh, then word spread about, you know, this girl uh, who would try to help others, who's fighting for her life uh, in a hospital, and more and more people donate. And uh, so the amount goes up and up, and uh, soon she surpasses the 
uh, the record for our, our birthday, which at that point had been raised by Justin Bieber, was about fifty thousand dollars. And so her mom is is whispering to her. She's in a coma. And nobody knows if if uh, Rachel could could hear that. Uh, and the amounts just go up and up, and uh, they they finally have to uh, disconnect the life support. It's clear that she's never going to recover. And so Rachel dies, but people donate $1.2 million uh, in her memory. Uh, and a year later, uh, her mom travels to Ethiopia with Charity Water and sees these wells that have been uh, dug and are transforming the lives of villagers in Ethiopia, people just like her daughter, uh, who now will have a chance to get clean water, a much better chance at life, uh, fewer parasites. And, you know, obviously there's no there's no salve that can erase the, the pain of losing your child uh, at age nine, but it was a way for to give some meaning and memory and legacy for Rachel's life. It was a way of other people to show their concern, to show their compassion, to memorialize an extraordinary young girl. And uh, as you read on page five, giving wells couldn't dissipate the grief, but it could turn it at least into something bittersweet. Now, I've seen this again. And just a couple of weeks ago, Eric Reese was in his daughter, Jessica, died at the age of 12 after 10 months of brain cancer. And she started and they continued Joy Jars, which has become this, this incredible, vast operation to bring uh, just joy jars to kids in pediatric cancer wards. And I think of the uh, of the family of Mark Daly, who was a friend of Hitch, and it was killed in combat in Iraq, and they are laboring to get a Fisher House open at the Long Beach VA. Grief powers a lot of this. It's an interesting connection it does. Uh, that I think goes to the to both the idea that grief can't be wished away, but you can make it into something else. You can transform it into something else. That's right. And, you know, it, sometimes it's sort of intuitive to do this uh, uh, as a way of memorializing somebody. What I think we don't do enough is that when we're upset or depressed or feeling lonely, we often withdraw into ourselves. And I think that, in fact, if at that time we can summon the strength to reach out and engage and even try to help somebody else, even though we're emotionally needy ourselves right then, that that can be a incredibly powerful way to help ourselves as well as help others. It, it recurs again and again and again in the book, A Path Appears. By the way, A Path Appears, how did you come up with the title? I saw the the, the epigram, but when did, it, when did the light go on and say, that's it? Well, uh, we were struggling over a title. In our previous uh, book, um, Half the Sky, came from a, a Chinese saying that women hold up half the sky. And I've always liked this uh, saying by the Chinese writer uh, Lu Shun, and, and hope is a real theme, and, and a path appears, and we think there should be more emphasis on hope. And the, the, the saying goes uh, that hope is like a path in the countryside. Uh, at first, there is nothing, and then because more and more people walk this way again and again, a path appears. It's, it's actually a beautiful saying, and a path appears. Wonderful book. It's in bookstores everywhere. It's linked at hughhewitt.com. We've got more than two hours left. Don't go anywhere. I think by the time we're done with this, you are going to change the way you actually live by changing the way you give and serve. Don't go anywhere. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Wrapping up the first hour of Three with Nick Kristoff, New York Times columnist, Pulitzer Prize winner, twice over, author along with Cheryl Wudan of the brand new book, A Path Appears, Transforming Lives, Creating Opportunity. It is linked over at HughHewitt.com. The documentary associated with it comes out in January. Many more different sorts of categories of interventions to be talked about and of strategies and of controversies in the world of giving and service. But this is a short segment, Nick, and so I thought I'd bring up Lester Strong, who in the writer's craft that you display, you weave him in at the beginning and then back at the end, page 6 and page 284. And I think he's intended as an example to sort of say not too late to start your own effort, even if it cannot be the experience core. He's 55, and and it's kind of a shout-out to the the late middle-aged, get off your butt and do something. That's right. Um, so Lester uh, was himself a um, kid who'd had a, a tough upbringing, and uh, his parents were were poor and not able to give him much help. And uh, the teacher kind of told him early on that he was sort of hopeless. That uh, his, you know, they told his parents they shouldn't waste their time, kind of give Lester uh, an education. 
And then there were some people in the community who said uh, there was a barber, there was a minister, and um, a, a friend of his mom. And they said, no, Lester, you know, you can make it, you can study. And he ended up doing really well in school and going on to um, – uh, to Davidson College, uh, Columbia Business School. He had a successful career in broadcasting. And then, you know, but he knew that this was only possible because there were some adults who had mentored him when he was very young. And so he wanted to give back. And so he's now running an organization called Experience Corps, which lets senior citizens volunteer and help kids in the situation he was once in. These are typically, you know, disadvantaged young kids in school, and it's helping uh, them learn to read, get books from the library, tutoring them, often getting the kind of help that middle-class kids always get, but that a lot of, you know, some working-class or disadvantaged kids don't always get uh, at the home. And uh, so it's just a fantastic outlet for people who have some time on their hands and want to give back um, and... um, and back to that it, longevity uh, studies or studies that you cite repeatedly in uh, in a path appears. It's not only for those who are being mentored; it's for the mentees as well. They're getting an extraordinary benefit of longevity and purposefulness in their life. It's a, it's a wonderful two way street where you start out helping somebody else, and you realize that they're giving you a sense of meaning in your life, a sense of fulfillment, uh, and a real satisfaction for for contributing, for giving back in ways that boost your own well-being, and boost your physical health. Not a cliche, and absolutely positively supported by the best research, as is uh, voluminously footnoted in A Path Appears. Hour two straight ahead. A Path Appears is over at HughHewitt.com. If you're running an organization, if you're giving away money, if you're part of any kind of a church that does that, if you have a missions committee, I think you ought to get A Path Appears and read it in your small group and really say to yourselves, are we doing this the right way? Are we asking the right questions? We'll talk about about those questions when we come back with Nick Kristoff in hour number two of today's Hugh Hewitt Show. Morning Glory and Evening Grace, America. It's Hugh Hewitt, hour number two of a special edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show, spending the entire program. Rarely have I done this in the 15 years of the show. Uh, maybe two dozen times, but Nick Kristoff, who along with Cheryl Wudun has authored the brand new book, A Path Appears, deserves it. A Path Appears debuts today. It's in bookstores everywhere. It's available at Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com uh, in every airport you go through. And I think if you, you'll you find it compulsively readable uh, because Nick and Cheryl have chosen an approach that is storytelling interlaced with academic research so that you're getting a lot of sort of David Brooksian social science and a great deal of tremendously moving stories of sacrifice, pain, and redemption, all organized around some themes about how to assess what you're doing with your own life without being didactic. So it's very good. I want to go to page 292, Nick Kristoff, Cheryl Dorsey, head of something called Echoing Green. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm probably not going to agree with Echoing Green very much, but I loved what she had to say. Quote, I start every talk I give at a university saying, please don't start another social enterprise. Young people have equated success with being a founder. That's the Achilles heel of our movement. And I tied that in to the stuff you wrote about cleft palates and clubfoot, and that's all early on page 19, or trachoma on page 306, or guinea worm and river blindness on page 245. We already know what gets remarkable return on investment. We don't need any new organizations, but you're even ambivalent about that message. Yeah, look, I'm, um, you know, I think it's exciting that so many young people especially want to give back and want to start organizations. And uh, I think social entrepreneurs sometimes can uh, really be very effective. Um, but it's also true that these days everybody wants to start their own organization. Nobody wants to join an existing organization. And so, you know, in the business world, you get scale, you get economies of scale, uh, you get mergers and acquisition, and all that helps create productivity and effectiveness. In the social sector, you don't have mergers, you have a 
million little tiny organizations that never really grow. And then the founder, after a few years, loses interest or gets busy and and then it kind of fades away. And uh, that's a real shortcoming of our efforts to try to help others that uh, we're just so focused on starting our own thing and being a founder that we're not willing enough to um, kind of s- subdue our own ego and work within a large organization. Yeah, what's interesting, though, the tension, uh, you may have heard me talk about this before because I think I had him on right after you once. Brian Ash was my son's college roommate at Colorado, uh, and he upped and graduated from Boulder, and he went to Kenya. He started to arrive in Kenya. He's now housing. It's been a year and a half. He's housing you know, two dozen Kenyan orphans from all different tribes. He has to turn them away. He's raising a lot of dough. It's because of the youth of energy and almost the ignorance of youth that allows someone to try something like that. That's right. I mean, and I don't want to discourage people who want to go and try to make the world a better place. And often, you know, some small little venture um, can really make a real difference for, uh, you know, for some number of people they interact with. And, and that's fantastic. Everything doesn't have to be a huge uh, scaled venture. On the other hand, when one is starting something small, when you don't have experience, you often can make mistakes and right. uh, you can be less professional. If you know there's a risk that you're going to be not as effective and occasionally a risk that you're actually going to do harm. So um, it's a complicated world and – I think right now we're just too, there's too much of a bias in favor of uh, starting one's own thing. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, I do want to pause on this cleft palates, club feet, trachoma, guinea worm river blindness. The return on investment, these things are not difficult to cure. They're very, they're really easy to cure. And the money, it made me think to myself, every dollar you give here in the United States to, to address anything, can save a, a children's life somewhere else with a club foot operation or, or casting. It's really remarkable. Yeah. Uh, you know, club foot is something that I was sort of only dimly aware of. It's a condition where you're born with a, a birth defect where your foot, uh, at least one foot, sometimes both feet turn inward. And so you can't walk. Uh, you Kept it, you know, you, you're not, if you're born abroad with it, you, you're not going to be sent to school. You're not going to marry. You're not going to work. You're probably going to end up a beggar in the streets until you die. And we don't see club foot here. It's not our minds because it's treated at birth. And when we were writing a path appears, it turned out that my mom had actually had club foot. And I'd been totally unaware of this because she had been treated at birth and, you know, she's going strong, uh, at age 82. Um, and, Yet, you know, in so much of the world, it's just it's such a tragedy and it ruins a person's life. And so we we followed a uh, woman in California uh, named Shoshana Klein who got a mailing about Clubfoot. And she had, as a baby, had had it, although, of course, she hadn't remembered it. And so that touched her. And so she sent off a check for $250 to this organization uh, to try to help a child with Clubfoot. And we followed the money. It went to a hospital in Niger. And it went to a girl uh, called Rashida, who was from a village where when people had clubfoot, they never got treated. They never got cured. And Rashida, because of Shoshana's $250 contribution, that was enough to get her uh, clubfoot repaired. And so she is now going to be able to go to school, live a full life, completely transformed because of that donation. And, um, you know, look. Obviously, donations don't always work. Some giving uh, is ineffective. There's corruption. There are a million problems. But does it sometimes work in a way that is completely transformative? Absolutely. And we saw that again and again. And there are reliability indices. If you want to be a risk taker and innovate, there are some that are riskier than others. But if you want just reliability, we're going to talk about adopted children programs and Clubfoot. There are some very extremely reliable. Let me ask you about um, an omission. Uh, it, with the exception of the mission continues on page 280 by Eric Greitens and a photo credit in the uh, Jim Oates photograph. By the way, I appreciate that you have photos throughout the book. Jim Oates is a San Diego giver on page 151, and some of his money goes to Semper Fi Fund. With the exception of those two references, you don't talk about military as much. Now, on this program, the time I have to allocate, I give to the Semper Fi Fund, the Injured Marine Semper Fi Fund, Fisher House, and the Gary Sinise Foundation. That's my time that I can allocate to charities. The network sponsors things with Food for the Poor, Salvation Army, Save the Children, Feed the Children. We have lots of charitable efforts. 
But I noticed that there's a there's sort of a hole in here about the charities that are serving the gravely wounded and the families of the fallen. Was that a choice or was it simply where your reporting took you? I guess it was really kind of where um, where reporting uh, took us, and we were we were really focused on um, especially early interventions um, and you know trying to create that opportunity. So. We looked, as you said, with in the Eric Ryden's chapter about um, about veterans, especially those with PTSD, and kind of efforts to to return them to the to the workforce uh, and and get them strong again. Partly through getting them engaged and helping others, but um, yeah, there's just you know only only so much space, and invariably uh, there's a lot of things that uh, that we could not. Well, one of my one of my address. suspicions, you, you, it's not being confirmed, but one of my suspicions is there are lots of frauds in the veterans charities. Uh, the Semper Fi Fund Fisher House have been charity star, charity navigator rated. Their overhead's very low. Gary Sinise's deal as well. But boy, are there a lot of frauds out there. And a lot of people who are making money off of helping vets because it touches the patriotic cord as well as the altruism cord. And you're very blunt. I've been regulating charities since I was at OPM and ran the combined federal campaign in the 80s. And you warn readers, there are many frauds in the not-for-profit worlds and that they've got to do their homework. I mean, one of the problems is that we tend to give not necessarily to the best charities, but to the charities that are best at asking. (laughs) So when somebody calls us up and if they, you know, they say they're raising money for, and then if they mention children with cancer, you mentioned veterans, you know, firefighters, widows. There, there are a few kind of key words that just make us feel okay. You know, I'll give X amount, and we don't know anything about that caller uh, or whether that money is used properly. And you know, if we care about children with cancer, if we care about veterans, uh, if we care about firefighters, widows, then we should want to make sure that our Twenty-five bucks or fifty bucks or whatever it is is actually going to help some. And uh, in general, we're much better off looking for a great organization rather than just you know giving money to somebody who calls us. Yeah, I learned a new word: chuggers. Chuggers, yeah, the uh, charity muggers. Yeah. Uh, they're, <laughs> I, I run into them uh, here in Manhattan all the day. They're people who were hired by uh, uh, by a charity, and they confront you on the street and say. You know, there are uh, children uh, who need sponsorship in, in, you know, in Southern Africa. You know, can you sponsor one child? And because you're confronted, you kind of feel like a heel if you just, uh, yeah. if you just walk on. Uh, it's, you know, it plays to our empathy. And, you know, some of these organizations are great organizations, but the problem with with responding in that way is that those people are typically not volunteers. They're they're typically being paid, and a lot of your money is going to pay them. So yeah. you're so much better off you know, a, going through finding your own organization and supporting them that way. There's a chugger outside my pharmacy uh, for homeless veterans, and I go in there you know many times a year to get something, and I think I give one out of ten times. It's irrational. My pattern is irrational, but chuggers aren't rational either. I'll be right back with Nick Kristoff, his book, A Path of Peer co-authored with Cheryl Wu Dunn, his wife. Uh, it's going to change a lot of lives. Stay tuned. One minutes after the hour, America. Nick Kristoff is my guest today. A Path Appears, his brand new book, co-authored with Cheryl Wudon, his uh, wife and colleague in A Path Appears, in bookstores everywhere today. It's pub date. It's linked at HughHewitt.com. And uh, there'll be a documentary on PBS. There is a website, apathappears.org. You can follow A Path Appears if you want to see how the book is doing and people's reactions to it on Twitter, of course, at A Path Appears. Nick's on Twitter, Nick Kristoff, K-R-I-S-T-O-F. And Cheryl's on Twitter at Wudun, W-U-D-U-N-N. And I'll give those repeatedly. Um, I, I want to pick up on the, uh, the question of... Uh, Early intervention. Uh, my Prop 10 commission spends a lot of more by law required to focus only on children zero to five to make them healthy and ready to learn. And so we've learned that those first three and a half years are critical. And one of the reasons I got very excited about the book, the nurse partnerships, we put a lot of money into that. It took us a long time to figure out that's that's where the return on investment is. I'm in so America. glad you're supporting them. Yeah. Well, tell people about what you discovered. That's why I got excited about a path of peers. You know, um, I came across uh, them and some of the research on them, and I, 
you know, as a journalist, you're trained to be skeptical, and the results just seem too good to be true. Here's an organization, uh, the Nurse Family Partnership, that uh, works, it begins working with a, um, usually a, 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 like a teenage, a low-income mom uh, during pregnancy, and then works with the, the mom uh, and the child until the child is two. And so it ends when that child is two. And yet, uh, 15 years later, that child has so much better outcomes than others who were randomly assigned to other groups. And it just didn't make sense that a program that ends so early could have such long-term effects. And yet, it the, the evidence is just overwhelming that it does. And now we sort of throw science behind it. That that period, as you say, from conception through the first two or three years of life is just critical and lays the foundation. And it's uh, part that's because when the brain is is developing and and the architecture of the brain is affected by um, by poverty, by stress, by uh, a mom uh, not uh, uh, not hugging a child enough, not reading to a child enough, not talking to a child enough, and. You know, there are sure there are some just bad parenting, but a lot of times there are ways that an outsider, a nurse who's sort of trusted, can uh, can create a better better parenting. And you know, part of it is encouraging the mom when she's pregnant not to drink, not to do drugs uh, after birth, to read to the child, to talk to the child. Uh, maternal attachment is just critical. And at age three and a half, uh, assessment of the degree of maternal attachment is a better predictor of whether that child will graduate from high school at age 18 right, it's amazing. than that child's IQ is. It's yeah, just it's incredible. Uh, you, you, you've you got a, uh, a source here who I know, Erwin Redlener, who's been a guest on the program. I met him actually traveling abroad once. Wonderful guy. Wrong on all things political, but a wonderful guy. <laughs> and, and he's uh, uh, president of the Children's Health Fund, and their research on this stuff is absolutely unchallengeable. On the other hand, now, Vic, this is where politics, you, you're, an, you're an advocate of advocacy. They take the good thing, which is you need the nurse partnership, especially for the poor, and they expand it to universal preschool by Bill, what's your mayor named? Um, Bill de Blasio. Yeah, he wants yeah. everybody to go to preschool. That's not the jump that needs to be made. That takes the targeted group and expands it far beyond the targeted group. And that's where my side of the political spectrum loses the focus on that which works. The, I mean, it, with all these interventions, the biggest bang for the buck is for the most at-risk kids. And the exactly. truth is, the middle, you know, the middle-class kids are already uh, getting a lot of support at home. They're getting their their parents are investing in them, and the. You know, the problem is that there are some kids who are losing the lottery of birth and uh, they're born to a family that, you know, maybe isn't exactly a family and they need that support desperately. And so um, in nurse family partnership, for example, so the most at risk kids uh, uh, that if you invest in nurse family partnership for nurse to work with that mom, uh, then for every dollar invested, there's five dollars and seventy cents uh, saved in public investment years later. But that is not true if you, you know, as you move to to less at risk kids. Exactly. Uh, and if and, and, and um, if you can stop a child from being exposed to alcohol and and fetal alcohol syndrome by intervening in the life of an addict. You've, the return on investment in the cycle it's of prison. It's just enormous. Yeah, it's enormous. Absolutely. It's, and so that's, that's where the political system diverged. I, I did want to bring up the one, the Bucharest Family Intervention Project. I tweeted out to you. That left me morally, uh, uh right. conflicted. They left half those yeah. babies in Bucharest. Tell people about that. Right. So, um, uh, in 1989, the, uh, Romanian, the communist government in Romania, uh, fell and, the Romanian government had had this just horrifying system of orphanages where these babies were in these little cots. Uh, there was nobody attending to them, nobody ever holding them, hugging them, talking to them. And uh, then communism fell, uh, and there were uh, some researchers came in, and they took some of these babies – out of the orphanages and place them in really good uh, foster care situations. And others, they left in the orphanages and they, they monitored them and they were randomly assigned. You know, some babies were taken out and given to these great foster care. And the difference uh, was enormous. Uh, and it turned out that what mattered was not only whether a child was taken out and put into foster care, 
uh, but at what age that was done. That basically, if a child was taken out uh, before the age of two, then kids had some resilience. They had some plasticity. They could recover to some degree. But if you took the child out after the age of two, then the damage was really done. And you can see in these brain scans of these kids, you can see many years later, you can tell which ones were taken out before the age of two and which ones after the age of two. So it, the, the lesson is overwhelming that those first two years of life are just critical. And if we miss that window, then it's hard to undo the damage. But, you know, as you say, we know this tremendously important thing because of this horrifying fact that there were these babies who were left behind in the orphanages. Uh, it's, 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 it's not tainted, but it's troubling. Uh, the University of Minnesota study also confirms the kind of parenting a child receives in the first three and a half years is a better predictor of high school graduation than IQ. Parenting being a big word, but on the domestic side, those organizations which are aimed at those critical prenatal and postnatal uh, years make up so much more of a difference and so much more of an impact that people have got to got to address that. And I think I think that's actually recognized widely now, Nick Kristoff, don't you? Yeah, I, I think it, we're becoming more familiar with it. I mean, I think that traditionally there was some idea that, oh, you know, little kids, they're resilient. So, you know, if they don't do so well in the first few years, then, you know, they'll get to school and they'll they'll recover lost ground. And in fact, just the evidence now is overwhelming from uh, from human studies, you know, these randomized control trials, from animal studies. Uh, there are these remarkable rat studies that it turns out that rats that are uh, licked and cuddled by their moms as, ki- as, as, as baby rats do much better as adults in mazes and things like that. And from understanding the brain science of you can, you know, you can see the architecture of the brain and the hippocampus, for example, uh, is smaller in, in babies that aren't, uh, that aren't being cuddled and supported. So, it's not, and it's overwhelming about the importance of early childhood interventions. Yeah, it's not debatable. Not debatable. I'll be right back with Nick Kristoff. The brand new book is The Path Appears. Go and get it during the break. It's linked at HughHewitt.com and bookstores everywhere. Stay tuned. Thirty-four minutes after the hour, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Publication day for a path appears. The brand new book. It'll be a, a New York Times bestseller. I'm certain by Nick Kristoff, Cheryl Wadon. Uh, it it chronicles in great detail and with very moving stories what works and what doesn't work in the world of service and giving and and of ending oppression. We'll get to some of that. This is sort of a high end question, Nick. Um, my law firm, Aaron Fox, like most big law firms, we encourage and we reward pro bono work. We got an a partner, Ambassador Prosper, who spends whatever time it takes to free American dissidents who are, who are wrongly imprisoned in places like Iran. We we support the Special Olympics World Games. We organize the Rule of Law Project in Afghanistan. My partner, O'Brien's over there dodging landmines all the time. Countless other things. Most big firms do that. Here's my question. Um, we could be just doing our law work, making more money, and giving the money away. That's the the lesson of Adam Smith is that specialization occurs for efficiency reasons. What do you think about pro bono work versus give the money away that you would earn from your highest and best use? Um, I'm a believer in pro bono work for uh, a couple of reasons, and obviously it depends on the quality of the pro bono work, and you know sometimes it's just decorative, but but often it really is real. And I'm I'm a believer in it for uh, two reasons. First of all, I think for those partners or associates at that law firm, I think it's incredibly meaningful for them. And I think it gives them a sense of engagement with a cause larger than themselves that they wouldn't get just by writing checks. And I think it, for the firm, it probably creates a sense of morale, um, helps with retention, with recruitment in a way that just writing checks uh, wouldn't. And I guess the other point I'd make is that there are a lot of organizations out there that need specialization. They need uh, good lawyers, for example, or they need accountants, or they need IT people. And if they can get those kind of uh, specialized services from an organization that will lend them those skills, that's incredibly useful to them. They need more than just money. Okay, that's a fine answer. And that is the answer that I I thought you might give, but I wanted to ask it. Now, let me ask about capitalization. Uh, I mentioned Thomas P.M. Barnett's been on the program before. He's written a great deal about development in a box. Big fan of Kiva. You write about Kiva, about care, about micro lending and micro saving generally. And uh, I mentioned earlier the book, The Poverty of Nations by Asmus and Grudem, a theologian and economist. 
And they point out you're never going to get long-term success unless there are things like the rule of law, um, guaranteed property ownership, and capitalization. How much do you agree with that? Because right now we're watching, for example, this horror story unfold in West Africa. Whatever has been done in West Africa, it's like the Rwanda effort, the bakery that you talked about. Whenever a catastrophe happens in a country without institutions and and deeply embedded civil society, it gets washed away either by the disease or by the violence. Yeah, I mean, I think you need uh, a few things to make development work. And and in my travels, I've seen this. I mean, one is that uh, you need security. And there, I remember in Central African Republic at one point seeing the shell of a hospital that had been built. And, you know, the kind of the only thing left was the sign saying it was donated by the German aid organization. And wow. uh, in, in the absence of uh, security, nothing else works. And, and you need good governance. I think the single... If you, if you look at Africa, uh, the single best, uh, explaining factor about why some countries have succeeded and why others haven't, uh, is probably the quality of the governance. Um, and, you know, in turn, that relates to education. And one of the reasons I'm a big believer in education is that I think it tends to raise the, the quality of governance and raise the expectations and kind of lay the foundation for improved healthcare, for improved governance, for, uh, more market oriented approaches, but there's no magic formula. And I guess that's the other point I'd say that I think we in journalism and the aid world, just as human beings, we yearn for silver bullets. And it always seems to me the better metaphor is silver buckshot. Huh. And there, you know, there, there are a bunch of things that will help incrementally and None of them is going to be transformative on itself, but you need education. You need early education. You need to save children early on. You need family planning efforts. You need health initiatives. And all these collectively will move the needle. Um, and it's not as if, you know, one is crucial and another is wasted, uh, but – there are a bunch of things that will move the needle. Page 41, the stakes are too great to fight the global war on poverty based on hunches and intuition. Just as the investment world has become increasingly rigorous, the nonprofit world should as well. That could lead, however, to um, not-for-profits shunning some areas and concentrating on others where that minimum security is available. I mean, you're not going to invest in Somalia right now. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a real uh, risk. Uh, and, you know, just as in, in capitalism, uh, you need people who are willing to take risks. Uh, you need venture capital. So we have to be willing to take some risks uh, in uh, in humanitarian world. But we need to know when we're taking risks. We need to assess that and take them at a modest level. I'll be right back with Nick Kristoff. A path appears in bookstores everywhere. It's linked at QQWit.com. Stay tuned. Forty-four minutes after the hour, America Chew Hewitt, joined by Nick Kristoff today, who, along with Cheryl Wadon, have written the brand new book, A Path Appears. Nick's won two Pulitzers. Cheryl won. A Path Appears, a brand new book on the not-for-profit world, what works when it comes to helping the very poor and lifting oppression from the very oppressed. And next hour, I've got the hardest questions lined up. I want to use this segment just to tell a few quick stories, Nick, to illustrate your technique. Beta Rose Nazoni and the Donuts. That's pretty amazing story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so everybody knows about microfinance, and but you know most of microfinance is micro lending, where you lend small amounts of money. And then, uh, as people were doing really careful studies, they were finding that micro lending um, is is useful. But the even more powerful tool is micro savings, helping people save their own money, and then you know, invest it in, in a good cause. And so BT Rose is this woman that I met in Malawi. And, uh, it's, this is an incredibly simple intervention to, to start because people are, you know, the villagers are starting, they're contributing their own money. So basically it's, uh, uh, just giving them a, a lock box, which is this wooden money box. And it has several padlocks on it. The lock, the keys are distributed among various people in the village. And, uh, then they have meetings and they bring, you know, a small amount, five or ten cents to each meeting. Um, and they start this custom of savings and then they invest it, uh, in small businesses. And so BT Rose, 
who was just the, just about the poorest, most forlorn woman in the village. She was getting beaten up by her husband. He's a drunk. Um, yeah, he's a, he's drunk. a drunk. He's spending what little money they have on uh, on prostitutes. Uh, and uh, you know, they had a child who died of malnutrition. Another child who died of, of something that was a little unclear. Uh, and, um, you know, so, so they had very little money and what money they had wasn't being used effectively. Uh, and so she started this little donut business and she turned out to be a really good donut maker. And once they got started in this sort of entrepreneurial tradition, they realized they could make money. Then it gave them a sense that maybe they could have a different future, and so she expanded her donut business. Then she uh, they she expanded her little agricultural plot, and she ended up renting more land. She started hiring other people to help her. Her husband and cleaned she, up. Her husband cleaned up, and he uh, he began selling goods in the in the city, and he stopped beating her partly maybe because she was earning the the money in the family. Um, but I think also there was a sense that, you know, he had a little bit of hope. I think he'd been uh, just self-medicating with alcohol, with prostitution. And the the upshot was that the family completely changed its trajectory through this, this project with CARE. Uh, it's called Village Savings and Loans. Uh, it's one of the most effective interventions that I've seen anywhere in the world. And, and one of the gauges of that is that it's self-replicating and that uh, it – other villages see that, okay, that village has these village savings and loans and these villagers all, you know, bring in the money. And so they want to adopt it themselves. So even if there isn't any aid worker to explain how to do it, they copy the model and so they – buy their own lockbox and they get somebody from the other village to show them what to do and okay they have these meetings and bring 10 cents each time and start a business and so uh this uh, it, has it goes spread. viral without the web it goes viral <laughs> exactly <laughs> without outsiders it's you know self-initiated and uh is really kind of transformative and you know the best kind of aid is when people can can help themselves now contrast that in in the middle of Malawi with <clears throat> Bernard Glassman and Greystone Bakery targeting the previously incarcerated for whom the rate of unemployment can sometimes approach 50%. Yeah, so Glassman, I mean, traditionally the way we think of, of you know, we should help people, oh, you know, give them a give them a handout or help them with this, help them with that. And, and Glassman wanted to start a business that would hire uh, people. So he started a bakery uh, in, uh, in Yonkers, New York, kind of, area, just a really decrepit area. And he said he would hire anybody. And uh, so he got a bunch of people just out of jail, a bunch of drug addicts. And uh, he managed to build a business, this bakery, making brownies for uh, Whole Foods and for others, and to keep it uh, intact. And look, it's an uphill struggle. And these are you know, people who don't have work histories, but he's training them. He's having these these workers coach each other, uh, kind of keep an eye on each other, support each other. And he's had some amazing successes. Um, and it, you know, this this notion of providing jobs to those whom who have trouble in the labor market, I think is an important model. Have you come across Father Gregory Boyle and Homeboy Industries because he does tattoo removals and Homeboy Industries are all uh, gangbangers in L.A. and he's been doing it, he's a Jesuit, been doing it forever and extraordinarily oh. successful on the same model as Bernard Glassman. But the, the previous, I've heard of him. I haven't, I haven't met him. I haven't seen it. Yeah, well, you're on the, you're East Coast. I, there is a little bias here on the East Coast, so you did get West a little bit. And my bias is West Coast, obviously, because I'm out here. But a couple more. Global Grandmothers, Dining for Women, all of these groups sort of self-organize. They're, you're almost overwhelmed by reading A Path Appears at how many people are organizing themselves to do good. Yeah, you know, I think there is this yearning on the part of people to do something more than just, you know, write a check and, and to do something social. And I think maybe part of it is that in a, you know, often this was something that people did, uh, through their church. Yeah. And that's where I was going. This is a, you know, this is a more secular age. There are a lot of folks who are less likely to be going to church on, on Sunday. And so, uh, the church no longer becomes a vehicle, but they still want to, 
engage in this community activity in support of their community. And so, you know, Global Grandmothers is this effort to support uh, to support kids who don't who aren't getting the right kind of gifts. And Dining for Women is a group that they they have a potluck dinner um, uh, and they donate the money that they would have spent going out to a restaurant to some kind of women's cause uh, somewhere around the world. And it's fun, it's social, and it gives them the feeling that they're really making a difference. And, and it, it, it also recreates what church used to put into people's life, the social connection with others involved to share the experience and grow it. That's why I think pretty much on every corner church in America, you'll find a missions committee. But in the secular absolutely. America, in secular America, they need things like this because that's you, the god shaped poem. The soul. I'll be right back with Nick Kristoff, uh, who confirmed for me something in a path of peers that made me very happy. I'll tell you about one of the most important chapters to me when we come back on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt here, a special edition of the program. Next hour, some of the hardest questions about not-for-profits uh, out there. But Nick Kristoff is my guest, who, along with his wife, Cheryl Wadon, have written the brand new book, A Path Appears. It's uh, in bookstores everywhere today. I've linked it at HughHewitt.com. You can get it at BarnesandNoble.com, Amazon.com. Every airport you go through, it'll be a bestseller. Nick, uh, Dwayne, my producer, has been producing the show for 15 years. Before that, he did five years with Warren Duffy. And for as long as he's been in radio, we've been raising money for World Vision, Children International, Save the Children, Compassion International, Plan USA. They all raise money on the radio. And you talk about the kids that you can sponsor. And you finally have the evidence. I've never seen it anywhere. Child sponsorship works. It actually matters to adopt and know the child. That's right. And um, I've been, a likewise, a child sponsor for, for many years. And I found this fascinating because traditionally the it was felt that the most effective kind of child sponsorship was one in which you weren't really so much helping that individual child, but you were helping the community. And so the argument was that the money is more effectively spent on a, a well for the village or, you know, a community uh, project of some kind rather than f- really focused on that child. And then um, Bruce Wittick, a, a economist, really carefully looked at Compassion International, which is a sponsorship organization that has a different model, and it really focuses on that individual child and tries to give them support and encouragement and and hope. And it found a enormous impact. And it's really a careful, well done study uh, looking at this real impact on that child. And it found that there was a remarkable effect, and it was really because of um, empowerment. And you know, empowerment is one of these sort of buzzwords, but what it meant is that. You know, a lot of people kind of feel sort of hopeless and they don't really think that there's much they can do. And Compassion International sponsorship gave these kids uh, through coaching, through support, a sense they could have a different future. And so they got much more schooling. They worked harder in school and they had long term, much better outcomes because of that sponsorship. And I think that there is, you know, a larger lesson here that we think that we're going to have an impact on people by giving them things. Uh, and sometimes that will indeed help, but often what they most need is a sense of hope and a sense that they can have a different future than what they expect. Uh, and then they, you know, they generate from within the energy, the ambition, the resources. Uh, to make that happen. And that connection with the family and the family writing the letters, it's all, it's all validated. And for a long time, I didn't know if it worked. I knew it was a good thing to try, but it, I'm so glad to see this study. Give Directly is another organization that gives money to very poorest families. Models a donor I know who, who would capitalize families with $1,000 or $2,000 to buy a business in the DR. Uh, it, it's just fascinating stuff. There's too much to cover in three hours, but we'll try in hour number three to get through it. A Path Appears is the new book by Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudon. Don't go anywhere, America. One more hour straight ahead on the Hugh Hewitt Show.